Hey guys, welcome back to a new video by Biology with Sunshine. So today we are going to continue with the IGCSE Biology Chapter 6, Plant Nutrition. This is for the syllabus 2023 to 2025 and 2026 to 2028. So today the content will be slightly longer than the past three videos, which only covers uh, quite a short amount, usually one subtopic only. Today we cover two subtopics, which is photosynthesis and the leaf structure. So photosynthesis will be our first part of today's video and as usual we have the learning outcomes uh, which is uh, copied from the syllabus so this will be helpful for knowing that what you are supposed to know for the exam and then this is for extended students which the core do not need to study these two points but an extended student should learn both core and extended items meaning both of these pages. Okay, let's start off with today with our first part, which is the equations of photosynthesis. So we must know that green plants, which we can see anywhere, like the trees, uh, like the grass, they all are considered as green plants. They make the carbohydrate known as glucose from the raw materials, carbon dioxide and water using in the presence of light and chlorophyll. So light can be from sunlight as one example. And at the same time, oxygen is made and is released as a waste product. Extended students are required to know the chemical equation. So you must know the differentiate, which is the word equation, which is the chemical equation. So the one of the top is the word equation. So I put that a W and then we have the chemical equation it is at the bottom. So core students usually need to know the word equation, meaning writing down carbon dioxide plus water to become glucose and oxygen. So typically in exam, they will give you two marks for this kind of question. They ask you to state the equation of photosynthesis. But for extended students, you must know that they can ask you to state the balanced chemical equation. What does it mean by balance is that having the six on the uh, left hand side before you write the particular reactant or the product. Okay, so this is quite simple. So now let's talk about the roles and the reactants of, of the reactants and the products. So carbon dioxide is uh, one of the reactants for photosynthesis, they diffuse into the leaf through the stomata. So what does diffusion mean? Diffusion means the movement of gas molecules from a high concentration gradient to a lower concentration gradient. So this is the definition that you should have known. And water is taken up by the roots and travel up the xylem. So how does water get into the plant? It's by osmosis. And now the products of photosynthesis, we have glucose. So glucose, they make the substance need for the plant and is used in respiration. So respiration is a key process that uses glucose to make energy for the plant. And oxygen is also one of the other products of photosynthesis is also used in respiration to release energy. Okay, so this is the four reactants and four reactants including the products also uh, functions of it on its own. Now, let's talk about overview of the photosynthesis. So plants, they need to photosynthesize to make food because plants are known as autotrophs. So this is a new term that you do not need to know a lot, but it's best that you know what does it mean. So auto means self. Trough is make food. Or you know this is known as, or this, if you combine both of them, it's known as self-making food. So the plant, they make their own food. They don't usually get feed by somebody. No, most of the time is that they make their own sugars. They make their own carbohydrates so they can build the plant uh, on its own. So same as humans, the plants make glucose and form starch, starch for storage. And photosynthesis is the process by which plants manufacture carbohydrate from raw material using energy from light. So now let's see what is chlorophyll. So have you ever wondered how the plant leaves look green? So it's because of chlorophyll. So a green pigment, which is known as chlorophyll, that is found in the chloroplast within the plant cell. So you have learned in chapter two that chloroplast is one of the organelles that is found in a plant cell only and not in an animal cell. So chloroplast inside will contain chlorophyll pigments which gives the color green so it reflects the green light giving plants their characteristic green color and what is the role of the chlorophyll is that it absorbs light energy and then its role is later to transfer energy from light into chemical energy so that is the function so you do not need to know any of the labels here this is not for 
uh, at this level. So this is, you can see this in A levels later on. So now, when we produce the carbohydrates such as glucose uh, form in the, as the products of photosynthesis, now you'll be asking me what are the particular roles that this glucose can become uh, to help build the um, overall structure. So first thing, the glucose is converted into starch molecules, which has an effective energy storage. And it's also converted into cellulose, which is also a form of carbohydrate. So it's starch, uh, cellulose, they are all carbohydrates, is to build the cell wall. And glucose can be used in respiration to provide energy. And it's also converted to sucrose for transport in the phloem. This one, you also will learn this in, I think, um, soon in transport in plants and it also can become as nectar to attract insects for pollination. So plants can also convert the carbohydrates made into lipid. If you ever wonder why, it's because carbohydrates have carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Lipids also have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. That is why they can convert from carbohydrate to lipids for an energy source in seeds and into amino acids to make proteins. When combined with nitrogen and other minerals absorbed by roots because amino acids also have C, H and O. It's just that they need to have nitrogen at the same time in order to become proteins, all right? So now let's see the minerals in plants which are important for uh, as like almost our nutrients like that. So photosynthesis produces carbohydrates, but plants may contain many other types of biological molecules, such as in proteins, lipids, and nucleic acid like DNA. So they also need mineral ions, which is absorbed from the soil. So what is the process that absorbs the mineral ions? This is by active transport. So active transport, they go against the concentration gradient using ATP or using energy. So this is how we link back to chapter three. Questions can become like this. They will ask you how does mineral ions being absorbed into the plant as one of the example questions. So two essential ions are magnesium and nitrate ions. So magnesium ions helps to make chlorophyll. Without magnesium, uh, this can cause chlorosis or cause the plant to become yellow. Nitrate ions, nitrate is similar to uh, it's almost like it has, it definitely has one of the uh, elements as nitrogen. So this one helps to make amino acids. So without amino acids, there's no more protein. Therefore, they can cause stunted growth, means they're unable to grow tall. They might stay really short as a plant on its own. Okay. Now, let's see investigating the need of chlorophyll. So for this, um, for this particular question, I have only given you um, just like a brief image, okay, from Save My Exams. So now we're going to see that how are we going to investigate the need of chlorophyll. So first of all, we see that um, the leaf is placed into boiling water. And now why are we using it to boil in water? Is to kill and kill the cells and break down the cell membrane. Okay, so then the leaf is left for a few minutes, up to 10 minutes in hot ethanol in the boiling tube. And this removes the chlorophyll, so color changes from iodine can be seen more clearly. Okay, what does this tell you is that they are trying to break down the cell wall so that the chlorophyll can be released into the beaker. Okay, then now they add it into ethanol. So this ethanol is added so that iodine can easily be stained and then this can produce you um, what you want to see. It's spread out in a white towel and convert covered with iodine solution. So then the, the, in a the green leaf, the entire leaf will turn blue-black as photosynthesis. This is occurring in all areas of the green leaf so you can see for this one the leaf is placed on the white towel and then now it is covered in iodine solution then you can see where it changes color because iodine turns from yellow to blue black in color or brown to blue black so when you observe that there's a change in color where it becomes blue black therefore the starch is there 
okay so this is one of the questions okay how are you going to solve this so in the photosynthesis experiment a plant is left in sunlight for several hours a leaf is then removed from the plant and tested for starch using iodine solution the diagram shows the leaf from the plant that was used in the experiment which diagram shows the result of the experiment okay so of course they are going to add the iodine solution inside here so now they're going to see what is the result you know that the positive result of iodine is blue black in color and they only show as a form of starch in the end so you need to know that when you see the green area you stain with iodine this is the part where it turns blue black and the white area means they do not have the starch when you stain it it will remain the negative result or remain the same color as before so which one responds to what i said just now the answer is c okay so if you need any more clarifications to drop them in the comment section below so this one is not so difficult but it's okay all right so this is the answer which is c now they want you to investigate the need for carbon dioxide so now this is going to be a little bit uh, confusing because first thing what are they going to do is that they're going to de-starch the two plants by placing them in the dark for a prolonged period of time. Then you place one of the plant inside the bell jar. So this is the bell jar and then uh, which contains a beaker of sodium hydroxide. And what is the purpose of sodium hydroxide is that they will absorb the carbon dioxide. You know, carbon dioxide is... Um, is in the surrounding all the time and that's, that's to see whether they need carbon dioxide or not then you place both plants in bright light for several hours so light is being shown and then of course um, it's going to allow it to photosynthesis at any time and then now they're going to test for both plants okay for starch using iodine and then uh, the leaf from the plant placed near the sodium hydroxide will remain orange brown as it could not photosynthesize due to the lack of oxygen and the leaf from the plant placed near water should turn blue black uh, as it has all the necessary requirements for photosynthesis so it's just basically checking whether co2 is important as a reactant it is important because it's one of the key reactants for photosynthesis now we see investigating the rate of photosynthesis so Plants are respiring all the time and so plant cells are taking oxygen and releasing CO2 as a result of aerobic respiration. But however, photosynthesis, one of the key requirements is that they need in the presence of light and chlorophyll. So me, what does this tell you? This tells us that photosynthesis can only take place in sunlight, which in daytime, but not during the night. So like what I said just now, they can only photos photosynthesize in daytime. But what about nighttime? So since they cannot photosynthesize, they'll be now using their glucose at night to undergo respiration. So they meaning they take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide to the surrounding. But now you can measure how uh, um, the amount of CO2 concentration released by using a hydrogen carbonate indicator. So this one is actually quite important because you um, sometimes in paper 4, they will ask you to, uh, they give you the scenario of this plant being placed in here and they ask you to use the hydrogen carbonate indicator to indicate what is the color that it will show under this particular concentration of CO2. So now, uh, how do I remember this? It's just by PM Roy. So it's just basically purple, magenta, red, orange, yellow. So P or purple, this shows that this is at lower CO2 concentration and Y as higher CO2 concentration. So meaning if I have a basically a jar which has high amounts of carbon dioxide concentration, if I add hydrogen carbonate indicator, it will turn yellow. If there is high amount of oxygen at low carbon dioxide concentration, then the hydrogen carbonate indicator will indicate purple in color okay so this is just very simple just remember that pm roy is probably the best acronym that you need to know for hydrogen carbonate indicator now we are going to enter limiting factors so there are three main factors that you need to know in limiting factors for photosynthesis so one of them is temperature another one is light intensity carbon dioxide concentration and uh that oh that's it only so now let's see how are we going to uh, understand this okay 
So first thing, we have temperature. So if you see from this graph, right, this graph kind of resemble to you the enzyme, the factors of how temperature affects enzyme activity. So yes, this is the same thing. So why is it reflecting the same graph? Because as temperature increases, right, the rate of photosynthesis increases because of course plants, they have an optimum temperature, but why they have an optimum temperature too? Because the entire photosynthesis reaction is controlled by enzymes. This is very important. That is why they are reflecting the same graph as the pH, uh, as the temperature graph in, in the enzymes that you learned in the previous chapter. So yes, now we are going to see that since we know that the reaction is controlled by enzymes, the trend only continues up to a certain temperature beyond which with the enzyme begins to denature and the rate of reaction decreases. So let's talk about slowly like um, how are we going to depict this graph. So when temperature increases, what happens? The rate or the number of collisions between the substrate and enzymes increases. So slowly when it rises, the rate of photosynthesis goes faster. But of course, when you talk about this point, when temperature is too low, it acts as a limiting factor. Uh, it also kind of inhibits a high rate of photosynthesis. But then eventually, they will reach an optimum temperature. When they reach an optimum temperature, you can see that this is the highest rate of photosynthesis it can possibly go. Then, of course, when temperature is further increased, enzyme starts to do not have that sort of high rate of collision as usual because the active site begins to change shape. So when it becomes to it begins to change shape, it starts to denature. So temperature is the limiting factor again. Why? It's because the temperature is too high. Okay, so that is how you understand this graph. Then the next one you see is light intensity. So what does light intensity mean? It means that the amount of light I shine onto this plant, what how does it reflect to the rate of photosynthesis? So let's see. So the more light the plant receives, the faster the rate of photosynthesis. So this is the one that you should know. Higher temperature, higher rate of photosynthesis. High light intensity, high rate of photosynthesis. So the trend will continue until some other factors required for photosynthesis prevents the rate from increasing further because it is now in short supply. So what does this mean is that, let's say um, light intensity from here, okay, it of course, it starts to Go, there's more light starting to be shined to the plant, right? Then the rate of photosynthesis goes higher and higher and higher. But eventually, it stops here. So it starts to plateau or become stationary. So this is the word, stationary. Where other limiting factors also take part into this uh, graph. Therefore, the rate be remains the same. So the maximum rate is reached. Temperature or CO2 concentration must be the limiting factor. So since light intensity reaches stationary, you must know that there are other limiting factors. So when question asks you to state that, what are the other limiting factors that um, causes, the, causes this particular graph to start to become stationary, then you can state it's either temperature or carbon dioxide concentration. But again, there's also one question they will ask you. They will label you A and B. So in section A, right, which is this one that I'm showing you right now, what is the limiting factor of this, of this graph? The answer is light intensity. Why? Because the graph is increasing. When it has an increasing trend, the only limiting factor that is controlling this is light intensity. But when they ask you to state the limiting factors of B in this graph, then light intensity is not the answer. So I, light intensity is wrong. So you must give either temperature or carbon dioxide concentration. This is how you answer some of the questions either in paper 2 MCQ or paper 4 uh, short answer questions. Okay. Now, we look at the final limiting factor, which is carbon dioxide concentration. It has almost the same graph as limit, uh, light intensity. So I will repeat the same thing is that adding more CO2 is like adding more reactant into the photosynthesis equation. When you have more CO2, the concentration becomes higher, right? So more of the CO2 being added will increase the rate of photosynthesis. 
So what happens when you increase? Of course, the rate of photosynthesis goes higher. So again, I will split the graph into section A and section B. Eventually, the graph begins to become stationary, almost the same as light intensity. Because above a certain concentration, the rate levels of probably due to all enzymes of photosynthesis being utilized, or the reaction cannot go faster, or maybe there could be other limiting factors. So the other limiting factors could be light intensity, or it could be temperature. So this can be the either one, but then they can ask you, what is the limiting factor in A? A is carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, so again, if you have any questions on these three limiting factors and the graph itself, feel free to comment down in the comment section below. Okay, so this is the summary of the limiting factors graph. So light intensity and carbon dioxide concentration is very similar. Actually, it's almost the same. It's just that temperature will have a U-shaped graph because this graph is almost the same as the uh, temperature affecting enzyme graph. Okay, so that's it. Now, let's move on. So now we have a special one. This one you may see in paper two usually. They will confuse you with different types of um, description in graph number one, graph number two, and graph number three. So the main thing we always love to do is that we separate them. So it has a... Uh, each of the graph, each of the level of the graph will eventually become stationary. So whatever that becomes before it becomes stationary, the graph begins to become straight in the line. It's always the intensity of light, meaning this is the x-axis. The x-axis is always the answer for both when it's like in its a slanted shape going up. So increasing light intensity will increase the rate of photosynthesis. But now it causes stationary, the line becomes uh, like a straight line already. So what is causing this is that let's see for the first one, first one. They say higher CO2 concentration and higher temperature. So meaning that uh, we have a high CO2 concentration, high temperature. Therefore, the graph is the highest because again, higher temperature, higher rate of photosynthesis, higher carbon dioxide concentration, higher rate of photosynthesis. Then now you see, highest for the second one, they say higher CO2 concentration, but lower temperature. The moment that it's lower temperature, the rate of photosynthesis is not going to say all the way going to decrease tremendously, but it's just going to be lower than the first one. Because, of course, it makes sense, right? Lower temperature, the rate of photosynthesis is much lower. And then the third one, when you have lower CO2 concentration, lower temperature, both of them, they reduce the rate of photosynthesis. That's why the graph is all the way at the bottom. This reflects the rate of photosynthesis. Okay. Now let's go to our last part, the leaf structure. Part two of this video. So now this is the game, the um, uh, learning outcomes. This one you can read on your own. Now we come to the leaf structure. So for the leaf structure, you unfortunately have to memorize all of these. So you just need to you need to know the cuticle, the upper epidermis. Uh, this is usually the usual plant cell organelles that you see. Plant cell organelles. Okay, you don't need to call palisade. You don't need to call vertical palisade cell. You can just call palisade or palisade mesophyll cell. Okay, then you have spongy mesophyll cell. This one you also need to know. Guard cells, stoma or stomata is okay. Air channel or air spaces is also acceptable and cuticle, okay? And the lower epidermis. This one is the xylem and the phloem. Uh, this you can known as the vascular bundle. So you have to know the entire diagram and its labelings, okay? So this one is essential. Now, I'm going to talk to you about, now you know the structure, right? Every time in bio, you need to know what is the function. The structure always links to the function. So, the structure of the waxy cuticle, which is found at the top of the leaf structure, it's here. So, what is the point of the waxy cuticle being on top? So, firstly, it's waterproof. It has a waxy protective layer. From the term waxy, it's made of wax. And wax is usually made out of fats, okay? So, you link with fats. 
So fats and water, they cannot mix together. Therefore, when water is falling on top of the waxy cuticle, it doesn't get absorbed, it doesn't get dissolved, it doesn't mix with the waxy cuticle. So it forms as a waterproof layer and prevents water from evaporating. For the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis, it's thin and it's transparent to allow light to enter the palisade mesophyll cell. And palisade mesophyll cell is found at the top of the cell, contains many chloroplasts that absorb sunlight. So what does this tell you in the end? Chloroplasts that absorb sunlight will link to photosynthesis. Okay. Or you can just say the function of the palisade mesophyll cell is photosynthesis. Spongy mesophyll cell is irregular shaped cell. You can see that they have different sizes and shapes. Okay. Uh, what is it for? Is that it allows for gases exchange or gas exchange to take place, which do not contain many chloroplasts. Vascular blunder is made up of xylem and phloem. This one you know later in transport in plants. Stomata or stoma are little holes that open and close to allow gases exchange to occur. And guard cells, they control whether the stomata should open or close because when they open, water can leak out from the leaf. So now, you have to know what is the adaptation of the leaf structure. Sometimes they will ask you, why does this leaf structure become so efficient for photosynthesis. So you can first say that it's a large surface area of the leaf. It increases the surface area for diffusion of CO2 and absorbing light for photosynthesis. Then you can say it's thin. The leaf cell or the leaf structure is actually very thin and it allows carbon dioxide to diffuse quickly into the palisade mesophyll cell. Chlorophyll, it absorbs light energy so photosynthesis can take place. It's considered an adaptation because animal cells do not have that. Plant cells specifically have chloroplasts so that they can make food, okay? And network of veins, so they have network of veins meaning like the xylem or phloem. They always have a lot of these and this will allow efficient transport of water and mineral ions throughout the plant. And they have a thin epidermis. You can see that the epidermis right, is actually considerably quite thin. So what is it for? Is that it allows more light to reach the palisade mesophyll cell. And lastly, they have a stomata. The stomata can open or close. So it, that kind of controls whether oxygen and carbon dioxide is going out or coming in, uh, depending on the situation or the environment that it, the plant is placed in. Okay. So yeah, any questions for this topic because we've come to the end. So if there are any questions, just feel free to uh, put it down in the comment section below. Hopefully I can respond to everyone as soon as possible. So thank you so much for watching. So this will be a rather boring chapter, but the next one will be human nutrition. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.